at design patents, um, which traditionally have a uh, view of being relatively easy and low cost to obtain and maintain, uh, at least compared to standard utility patents. Uh, the applications for design patents are much uh, more compact and brief, and the uh, maintenance, specifically maintenance fees, are much uh, lower cost. Uh, design patents do not have maintenance fees. Uh, just because design patents are easy to obtain um, should not necessarily equate to unbroadly narrowing their scope when preparing a design application. Um, good thought should be put into the designs to be included as the various embodiments and the use of various lines, uh, types, so solid lines and broken lines to specify claimed and unclaimed matter. Uh, some of the strategies that we practice here at Beach and Beeman are to look at design patents as part of an overall strategy uh, that fits in with utility patents and, and other intellectual property uh, to develop a good rounded portfolio on a case by case basis. In particular, design patents are particularly useful when there is no utility to what you're trying to protect um, and you're trying to protect an ornamental appearance is the only uh, novelty. Uh, and this happens a lot when you have a product update that occurs year over year, every few years, uh, that may be already covered by an existing utility, utility patent, but the product itself looks different than previous years. So this slide shows kind of the overview of what we're going to talk about today. We'll start off discussing uh, the differences in design patents um, and their to the other various IP protection schemes, such as trade dress and utility patents. Uh, we'll also talk about the prosecution and litigation of design patents. Um, and then finally, we'll wrap up with touching on uh, some differences and considerations to, to, to have when filing a US patent, a uh, design patent abroad, or bringing a uh, design patent that was originally filed abroad over here into a national stage in the States. So starting off, what are design patents? Design patents are codified at 35 USC 117, which defines design patents as being new and ornamental designs for an article of manufacture. The MPEP expands on this and that the design is the visual characteristics that are embodied or applied in the article. So it can be a shape, it can be a surface ornamentation, or it can be a combination of those things. Um, and as a whole, the design itself is a part of the article. Uh, it cannot be pulled from the article and looked uh, in and of itself. Um, that would be something that you might want to consider protecting more with, with copyright. So comparing design patents to trade dress, some of the biggest differences are their term. Design patents uh, receive a 15-year term, whereas trade dress can have an indefinite term so long as you are using the article in commerce. Design patents have to be new and non-obvious, um, whereas with trade dress, uh, there is not the novelty or non-obvious new requirement. Instead, you need to show that the uh, Consumer public uh, views the trade dress as a source indicator. Uh, there's also a difference in infringement tests. Uh, the design patents are subject to an ordinary observer infringement test, which we'll dig into a little bit later in the presentation. Whereas trade dress uh, infringement uh, requires consumer confusion, uh, which can, in proving can often involve uh, doing surveys, um, that can be quite cumbersome and complicated. Finally, uh, another big difference between design patents and uh, trade dress is their fees. Uh, as I previously mentioned, design patents have no maintenance fees. So once you get your application allowed and on file and you pay your issue fees, then you have your design patent for the term. Um, whereas trade dress, you have to initially pay maintenance fees at five years and then 
uh, at 10 years intervals after that. One strategy that can be considered um, in filing a design patent is converting the design patent into trade dress protection as the design patent expires. And the way to do this is to establish secondary meaning in the design. Um, a good application for this um, would be if your product is something to, uh, akin to a Coke bottle. Uh, when the Coke bottle first came out, it was just a, another shape of a bottle, um, which would be uh, protectable under a design patent. And throughout the use of the, the specific shape with the Coke bottle, it develops secondary meaning, which then can be translated into trade dress. So moving on to comparing design patents to utility patents, as we mentioned earlier, design patents protect ornamental, ornamental features. So it's the, the look and the aesthetics of the product. Um, utility patents protect functional items. So the actual structure or the method of using a, a product that is new and non-obvious in and of itself. Um, another big difference between design patents and utility patents is that design patents uh, are limited to a single claim and have more of a, a central claiming system where you, you're comparing uh, the claim itself uh, to the alleged infringing article to see how close it is uh, compared to prior, which we'll discuss later with our ordinary observer test. Um, whereas utility patents have a specific peripheral claiming mechanism where you look at all the elements in the claim and if you don't meet every single one of them, um, then you're, you're not infringing. Um, so this image here on this slide kind of shows the difference. It shows a, a belt ball bearing, which looks very similar to the ring image, um, but you would use the different protection schemes um, for their different functions in either of them. Um, design patents um, overall provide a way to kind of round out a portfolio when utility protection might not cover it. Um, and as we discussed, they, they can be easier to retain, especially if you are looking to get your product marked as being a, a patented product. We're gonna talk through a couple of cases here that describe functionality requirements and how uh, functionality is applied to design patents. One of the earliest cases was In re Carletti. In re Carletti, the application was for the design of a series of ribs and grooves around the underside of a cap seal. So if you'll see in this image, there's a single kind of rib going around. I did not have a, an image from the actual car ready device or application. Um, but in that design, they were claiming groups, a groove that had uh, ribs on either side that weren't the same height. And that design in and of itself was new. Uh, looking at the design, um, the court found it not to be ornamental, but to be purely functional. Uh, there was admissions on the rec record that the ribs and the grooves were directed towards providing a better, better seal. Uh, and in looking at that also just kind of the general use of the seal as being sandwiched between a, a cap and a hole that the cap was sealing over. The cart specifically said that it would be naive in the extreme to believe that someone would ornament a gasket that would be so you know, essentially hidden from view. Uh, the applicant tried to, try to put forth that the symmetry in their design was ornamentation. Um, which the court shot down and as mere symmetry is not ornamentation. Um, and in there, the dicta of the court seemed to imply that there was almost a mens rea or intent uh, quasi requirement um, that what was being done in the product was to be done uh, as specifically as an ornamentation and not just merely a, a byproduct ornament, ornamentation of a, of a functional design. A more recent case, just a few years ago, uh, occurred. I don't know if you guys recognize this product. Anyone, you know, with, with kids or nieces or nephews, uh, but this is this is 
at least what my kids know as uh, a puddle jumper. Um, and it's a flotation device that wraps around a torso and has arms, arm wings that are attached to the torso. Uh, and in evaluating the uh, scope and validity of the patent here, the lower court specifically pointed out that the arms and the shape of the arms and the protruding side torsos attachments were all elements that serve a function rather than an ornamental purpose. And so what the lower court did was it pieced those elements out on kind of a piecemeal basis. And once they were excluded entirely from the design, there wasn't really anything left uh, to protect. So it, the lower court rendered the patent invalid as having no scope. On appeal, the district court, or the uh, appeals court, called out the district court on the, the methodology of evaluating, um, specifically that, that kind of the piecemeal methodology of selecting functional uh, elements and then removing them completely from consideration um, was not the way to go. And what the court should have done was look to the overall product as a whole and focus on which elements in that overall uh, product or design uh, contributed to the overall ornamentation. So they didn't give a, a you know, kind of a specific uh, interpretation or scope for the low court to use, uh, but they did say you need to try again and the piecemeal approach was not appropriate. Uh, a third case, and this one's even more recent, um, this case involves <clears throat> design patterns that are directed towards specific components uh, on the exterior of a, of, a, of a Ford F-150. So it's the design of the hood and the design of the headlights. Um, the Automotive Body Parts Association uh, tried to push back on these, these design patents because they're in the business of, of supporting kind of the, the uh, aftermarket parts. And the first thing they pushed back on was the uh, aesthetic fun functionality uh, from trademark law. Um, aesthetic functionality in trademark law is a little bit different than in design law in that uh, they're looking to the the, the function of the aesthetics to provide a secondary meaning, not necessarily the utilitarian functionality. Um, so the court, you know, declined on applying that to design law. Um, another argument that they made, and this was, this was a really interesting one, was that the individual design patents uh, contributed uh, as their function to cooperate with other uh, components of the vehicle to give the overall look and feel of a, a vehicle as a whole. Uh, to, to support this, they pointed to a case, uh, Best Lock Corp v. Illico Unican. Um, in that case, the design that was considered functional and excluded um, was the keying, the, the individual grooves and things on a key that turn a tumbler. And so in that case, the, the keying on the key actually provide a function of locking or unlocking a lock. Um, the ABPA tried to extend that case to say that here, just like the key functioning with the lock, the, or the design of the key functioning with the lock to open the lock, they're saying that the design of the hood and the headlights would function with the other components to provide an overall ornamental design of the entire vehicle. Um, the court, again, wasn't buying it. Um, at the end of the day, they said it, at, that none of this function that was being argued was actually a function. It was just aesthetics and how different aesthetics would cooperate with each other. Um, and one of the tests uh, that they kind of looked to um, in coming to that determination was that there were alternate functional designs still available. So you could get a different hood and put it on your F-150 or a different headlight and put it on your F-150 and it would still perform the necessary functional requirements of covering the engine compartment 
or providing illumination to operate the vehicle. The ABPA also tried to extend the doctrine of patent ex exhaustion in this case. And the patent of exhaustion um, is, is also can be uh, analyzed with the first sale doctrine, essentially that once a, a patented article is sold, then the uh, patent owner's rights in that article are exhausted. Uh, however, this doctrine is limited to the specific item that is sold. So once you buy one hood or one vehicle that has one hood, then you have rights for that one hood. But in purchasing a second hood or manufacturing a second hood, your, your patent rights from the original purchase don't extend that far. They also try to extend their right to repair, um, which in utilitarian patent law is that once you purchase a, an article that, that is patented, you can service and repair that article. However, you cannot fully reconstruct it, uh, nor can you replace or reconstruct individual elements within that, that article that have patents on them themselves. So in this case, the, the individual items were the hood and the headlights and that they were not permitted to be reconstructed or repaired, uh, not repaired, reconstructed or replaced uh, because the overall vehicle of the F-150 was damaged. Moving on, we'll talk a little bit now about uh, preparing, prosecuting and litigating design patents. Uh, touching on kind of some fundamentals of applications, um, some things that you'll run into in, in filing amendments or continuation applications, and, and then kind of the infringement, which is going to be a discussion on the uh, infringement test, which is the ordinary observer test. This slide shows a design patent for the ring that's shown in the image. And there were a few more figures here in the actual design, but as far as the text, um, this, is, this is pretty much in and, in and of its entirety. Um, anyone familiar with utilitarian patents will appreciate how, how brief and, and uh, simple this or patent is, is compared to utility patents. Um, one thing to note in particular is that there is only one claim here. And then that claim basically is saying, I am claiming the ornamental design for the ring. So that's the article that the design is applied to. And then it says shown and described. So it's shown in the figures. And then if you notice underneath the, the figure listing, there's a, a disclaimer there about what is being claimed and unclaimed. In the figures, you'll notice that there are solid lines and broken lines, which have different meaning. Now we can jump into the next slide um, and look at some of that. So the solid lines is the claimed subject matter. So the, the, that kind of defines the meets and bounds of what the, the design is. Uh, broken lines represent unclaimed matter uh, and they can be of two different types. Um, here the broken lines are representing structure. So they're illustrating that you could put a gemstone here into this design, but they're saying that you don't necessarily have to put a gemstone in the design, nor if you do put a gemstone in a design, does it have to be this specific round? I believe that's a princess cut. I'm not 100% sure on that though. Um, the other type of unclaimed lines are boundary lines, which are not shown in these figures. Uh, we'll get to one a little bit later in one of the other cases, but a boundary line is basically a, a, a abstract conceptual line that doesn't apply to any kind of physical structure of the device itself, but it is providing a boundary to a claimed area. So if, a, if an article has a large surface with a you know, claimed line around it, you can exclude areas of that surface from being claimed with a boundary line. Uh, also in, this, in these figures, you'll see the use of shading, which provides uh, and illustrates contours of various surfaces. Shading is not required in the states, um, but it is recommended to show designs. Um, you can also use indica in your design that show contrast of color, graphical representations, other ornamentations, 
you know, so if, if you have something, you know, it's a specifically kind of a, a wood grain color or it's a transparent piece of glass, um, that kind of thing can be represented. Um, it is possible to, to file photographs as part of a design patent. Um, I personally don't recommend it because they, they don't provide you with a very good idea of what is being claimed for the design. Um, so at a very minimum, if you're filing a, an application with photographs, you'll want to put in a disclaimer. Uh, it's preferred to uh, use those photographs instead as a, a basis and, and get some line drawings worked out by a, by a draftsman. Um, amending an, an application once it's been filed, either as you know, part of the prosecution process or to when you're claiming priority um, from a, convision, a, con, a conversion patent, continuation or divisional patent. Um, the big rule of thumb is that you cannot introduce new matter in your amendments um, if you want to maintain priority um, or introduce them in prosecution. And the, the test for that is whether a person of ordinary skill um, would have possession of the, the amended material based on the original disclosure. More generally, uh, when it comes to, to kind of broader patent principles, such as prosecution history estoppel, you know, all, all of the, uh, the case law and statutory law behind inventorship, anticipation and obviousness, a lot of it applies uh, to design patents, which we'll see in some of our upcoming cases. So this first case illustrates some, uh, <clears throat> some of those basics in, in kind of application and amendment fundamentals. Um, if you'll notice over here in figure right, there is a kind of this uh, pattern shown of a rattan design. Uh, the application itself did not show any specific articles for this uh, design to be applied to, uh, but it did describe as part of its original application that it was a design for a furniture part with a title furniture. The patent office pushed back and said that that description was too vague. And in response, the application was amended to be a pattern for a chair. Down the line, uh, Curver tried to uh, enforce their patent against uh, defendant home expressions who made a basket that had a, a similar rattan design. The case was dismissed um, based on the, the rationale that the basket was not a chair and that in, a, in amending the application, the applicant was specifically uh, defining the scope of their protection as being for a chair. In this case, I'm not sure if it would have come out much differently if they hadn't amended and they just had started off with a pattern for a chair. Um, however, as, as we'll see in some of the examples later, um, there might have been a, a better way to get broad protection kind of on this design to cover baskets and, and, and other things um, in kind of showing more articles in various embodiments in the figure. So you would perhaps, you know, have the rattan design on the chair and only show the design in claimed lines and the remainder of the, the chair in unclaimed lines. Um, and then you could also show baskets and, and other articles. Um, and then you'd have to come up with kind of a, a creative, creative article definition that was specific enough to be acceptable to the patent office for the use of the written portion of the application. Um, another case that, that kind of we're gonna to touch on um, is In Ray Daniels. And this involves the addition of new matter and whether or not the addition of new matter uh, would obviate a priority claim. So the original application figure is shown there on the left. And this is for a leecher device, which apparently collects leeches. Um, the original inventor here, um, and this is in, in a information that was included in the opinion, but in kind of the background, but not necessarily in their justification for their outcome, but it's, it's interesting nonetheless. But the, the inventor here originally tried to protect, was intending to protect their idea uh, and thought they were getting utility patent protection. 
and they went to a you know a third party uh, inventor assistance type organization um, that was deceptively running a promotion um, where they would guarantee that they could give you a patent um, or your money back. Um, in order to obtain that patent, the third party added leaves to the design and filed it as a design patent. So this is one of those cases where yes, it's easy, can be easy to get a design patent, um, but you could end up with unduly narrow protection. Um, kind of after realizing the situation that they were in, the inventor uh, worked with a, a, a different attorney obviously and filed a continuation application that claimed priority to the original design. The priority was needed because there was prior art from the original design that would have um, arguably invalidated the continuation application. Um, originally, uh, priority was de denied, saying that the removal of the new leaves and presenting the design uh, as being without the leaves uh, indicated new matter. Uh, the, on appeal, it was reversed uh, with the rationale that the kind of overall design of the lecture was still the same and that was all disclosed in the original application and that the leaves that were added or originally existed um, and later removed did not obscure what would be behind them, I guess, and, and priority was given. Um, so in this case, it was, it was okay to take away that portion of the design and claim the child uh, with broader coverage. Um, another case that came out a little bit later was In Ray Owens. Um, this was for a bottle. If you'll notice the two figure sets on the right, the top is the parent application and the bottom is the child application. In the parent application, you'll notice that what's being claimed is kind of the overall general outline of the bottle and the sub features of, of kind of those uh, geometric shapes are not being claimed nor are being claimed as the cap. In the continuation application, which is similarly to the Daniels case, um, required priority in order to be valid, uh, converted lines from being unclaimed to claimed and added a boundary line. So if you look over on the bottom right figures, you'll see there's the two vertical triangles on the shoulders that are now claimed that were originally unclaimed. There's the thin little horizontally elongated uh, semicircle or triangle that's being claimed um, that was a conversion from unclaimed line to claim lines and then there's the central um, trapezoidal feature that has a line going horizontally between the two shoulder portions that did not exist in the original. That line is a boundary line and, and what it's doing is it's restricting the, the area of that front shape that's being claimed to being only a, a, a sub portion of it. The applicant here argued that, uh, like in Daniels, um, putting that boundary line was merely reducing the amount of claimed features. So instead of removing leaves, they were just simply removing surface area. There was no new surface area that they were creating. Um, the court, however, disagreed uh, and said that uh, by putting in that boundary line, they were creating a, a new shape to, to what the claim area that they, were, that they were making. And that was new matter and no priority was granted. <clears throat> Excuse me. This case has a lot of interesting dicta of, of when a, a boundary line can be put in. Um, and it, it seems like it, Safest to say that that what that a boundary line can be put in whenever a, an explicit boundary already exists. So in this case, there was no explicit boundary there, so it was it was new matter. Um, for the most part, uh, it, it seems that uh, converting from unclaimed lines to claimed lines or vice versa is not an addition of new matter. Um, and I, as far as as reconciling this case with Daniels. It seems like there's kind of two factors. 
Um, one is kind of the soft human factor in that Daniels was a very sympathetic uh, party. And he'd been taken advantage of and, and kind of what he was getting was what he originally was, should have filed on, um, which was then Owens was not as sympathetic. Um, but more importantly, I, I think that the, the distinction really is that it seems like adding new matter is adding ink. Um, if you'll notice uh, in uh, Owens, we were adding a boundary line. So that's the addition of additional ink. Um, whereas Daniels kind of, we were, we were taking it away. Um, so kind of food for thought and kind of, you can use these cases to kind of best fit whatever situation you're in. Um, one more case on, on kind of prosecution is another, uh, this is a, a, an extremely recent case within the last year or so that has to do with obviousness. Um, the applicant here filed two, had two design patents that are shown on the top, which were subject to challenge in an IPR. And the board uh, dismissed the IPR and, and left the patents as, patents as being valid because it thought that neither reference presented uh, in the IPR for invalidation were close enough to be primary references. Uh, in design patents, they're to be qualified for a primary reference, uh, such reference needs to have uh, a visual impression uh, that is basically the same as uh, the, at the uh, applicant. And here, uh, the bottom two are the uh, two prior arts that uh, the IPR found not to be uh, sufficiently close to be primary references. Uh, some of the reasons that they distinguished the Samways, which is on the right there, was that it had, you know, two shoots and an arch covering, you know, the, a double soup shoot, um, you know, and the, and the court upheld the IPR there. Um, for the left, which was the Lintz patent, one of the distinctions that they made for it not being a, a primary reference was that there was no can shown in the bottom of the tray. Uh, on appeal, the court looked to the admitted use of the prior art as a can dispenser and said that it would have been obvious that a can would have been there and that, you know, excluding that can was not an appropriate reference based on kind of the, the intended and admitted use of this article. Um, and so it, it kind of creates the extra, extra tool in our toolbox that we can kind of go beyond the four corners uh, of specifically what's disclosed into the document to, to what uh, the article would actually look like in the real world in practice based on that disclosure, uh, which is something to use. Um, moving on, um, even though we can only have a single claim in our patent, design patent, we can show multiple embodiments. And in order to, to have those multiple embodiments, all maintained in a, in a single application and issue as a single design patent. The embodiments have to have an overall appearance that's basically the same, and the differences between them have to be uh, insufficient to make them patently distinguishable from each other. A specification that when you should make clear which figures relate to which embodiments. Uh, design patent figures are uh, looked at a lot more closely than utility patent figures for continuity among the figures. Um, and then just like with design patents, when there's no patentable distinction between embodiments, anticipation or obviousness of one embodiment would be sufficient to, to reject them all. Um, so similar to, to utility patents, when the patent office determines that the uh, multiple embodiments uh, show different inventions, or in this case, that are just towards different claimed material, and should be broken up into different claims. Um, the patent office will issue a restriction requirement. <clears throat> Unlike utility patents, there is no uh, criteria uh, requiring a special search burden. Um, so it's purely, purely just based on kind of the figures themselves. Um, and then again, similar to utility patents, 
once a uh, invention is restricted out and, and elected, the other non-elected embodiments um, can be pursued in divisional filings. And a, a failure to pursue those divisional filings can result in, in kind of a loss of rights, which we'll touch on in some of these upcoming cases. So this case is, is my, I think is the most interesting in the whole slide deck. Um, Pacific Coast Marine and Malibu boats are, are the parties here. Um, and Pacific Coast Marine filed a, <clears throat> an application for a design patent for a windshield of a boat. So I'm, I'm sure uh, you guys have seen uh, like open cockpit ski boats and things. And so all these figures are, are reproductions of the various embodiments in the original application. If you'll notice here, there's seven different embodiments. Um, some of them have uh, hatch on the front windshield. Some of them have openings in the pillars. Uh, and then those openings are of various number and shape in the pillars. Um, and then across all designs, there is kind of a, a common overall shape to the outer perimeter of both the windshield, uh, the side shields, and the pillar connecting them. The examiner here issued a restriction requirement uh, indicating that these seven figures were represented of five patentably distinct groups of designs. So I'm going to pause here for, for 10 to 15 seconds and I just want everybody to kind of take a look at these seven different uh, embodiments and think about how you would group them into five different groups of designs. And here's what the patent office did. They broke up the embodiments based on the presence or absence of the windscreen hatch and based on the number, but not necessarily the shape of the uh, side vents. So you'll see figure or group one is figure one, which has four side vents and no, no screen or it has a screen. Uh, group two is seven and 12, which both have four side vents and no windscreen. Uh, group three is, is figure eight, which has no side vents and a windscreen. Nine is group four. Um, and, and you can kind of look through all that. So the, the board and the, the patent examiner in this case thought that what made kind of the patentable distinction was either that there was or was not a hatch and the number of the vents and that the shape of the vents uh, was patentably indistinguishable. Ultimately, We'll go back here. Ultimately, Malibu Boats uh, elected figure one, group one, and received a, a design patent on that embodiment. And they also filed a divisional patent on group, uh, figure eight, which was group three, which are shown here. So the top two images shown here are what was uh, pursued and ultimately obtained coverage on. Uh, figure 11 shown on the right was one of the embodiments in the original application that was given up to the public. Uh, and then along comes Malibu Boats uh, with a windscreen that has an overall kind of shape and feel very similar to the uh, claimed designed patents in their windshield. Um, however, it has a different number of vents. In particular, uh, the number of vents is right smack between the claimed four vent design and the two vent design that was given up to the public. Uh, in this case, um, Malibu tried arguing that Pacific Coast had given up and uh, was, was stopped from enforcing their patent against the three-hole design because of what they had given up by not pursuing the two-hole design. Um, specifically, they, were, they were said that what was given up was a, anything beneath four holes or anything between the range of three holes and no holes, which they were safely in at three holes. Um, 
the court here said that did disagreed and said the prosecution history did not apply um, and that the kind of correct determination was to look at what was given up kind of in, it, in its own regard and see how well uh, the alleged infringing product fit within that scope and which was not an argument that Malibu made. Uh, you can imagine that, that a lot of the arguments that would, would put the, the three scope uh, the three hole design into the scope of the two hole design could equally be applied to the, to the, the four hole design. Um, unfortunately, we don't have an, an ultimate resolution here, um, but we do have a, a kind of understanding that when evaluating what was given up as part of the prosecution history um, needs to be design, uh, examined in that kind of isolated uh, manner of what was given up, not kind of comparing what was given up to what was claimed. Looking at uh, kind of back at this case, um, with, the, with the benefit of hindsight, it seems that uh, Malibu boats might have been better served to uh, originally file their various embodiments if they wanted to include all of them as having the hatch and the holes in unclaimed lines. So that if they needed to kind of put those lines back in there for uh, you know, prior art purposes and to obtain their patent on novelty or non-obvious grounds, they would have that option to do so. Um, but then in, in enforcement, it would be kind of clear that they were protecting this, this overall shape of the windshield. Um, and that included designs that may or may not have vents or front, front hatches. Yeah, that's hindsight, which is better than hindsight, usually. Um, the next case we're going to look at here, um, which kind of contradicts the previous case, and I think it's a little bit distinguishable as well, um, is Advantech versus Shanghai Tools. The applicant here originally filed an application for a, and this is a, kind of a dog kennel, and the first four figures of the, of the application were similar to the line drawings shown on the top. Um, specifically, it was for the frame only, and there wasn't a cover on it. And then the fifth figure had the cover. Um, the patent office said that these are two different embodiments. One has a cover, one doesn't. Please pick one. The applicant picked uh, the frame only embodiment and proceeded to get a patent, design patent on that um, and did not pursue uh, a divisional application on the frame with the cover. Along came Shanghai Tools. Um, their product included both a frame and a cover and a suit against Advantech to enforce their frame only design patent was originally dismissed uh, based on that case that we just talked about. Specifically, the lower court said, look, you know, you had this design and it is clearly, you know, right within what, what Shanghai Tools is doing and you gave that up. Um, Advantech took it up onto appeal. Um, on appeal, it was reversed. And the rationale was that the cover was this kind of extra piece that could be added to the design. Um, and that whether or not the, the cover was there or not, the frame would still infringe. Um, so ultimately there, there was uh, kind of infringement or that could be found because prosecution history would not stop them here. Um, I think the biggest distinguishing thing between the two cases um, is that uh, in Advantech, the cover is a uh, discrete removable structure that's intended to be removed. So the the, the, the article itself could be intended to be used without the cover or with. Whereas if we look at kind of these, these boat designs, I don't think there's any real way that kind of once the article is manufactured that it's going to, to change condition from having vents to no vents or three vents to, to four vents and, and what have you. Now we've been looking at kind of some of the pitfalls of multiple embodiments. And, and how they can limit your rights. But there are excellent uses of 
multiple embodiments in an application where you are using them to either broaden the kind of scope of what specifically you're claiming, the design itself, or where you're kind of broadening the scope of the claimed article. So these, the design patent figures reproduced on the left are from a, an, an issued patent that includes 50 different embodiments. And these are, these are cup holders that also I think function as bottle openers. Um, but each embodiment had an individual state of the 50 United States. And so what they were doing here was they were, they were showing that what the inventor was claiming was almost a kind of this conceptual idea of, you know, incorporating a, a state outline as the design um, into their article, you know, and, and filing just a single state uh, would be insufficient. And so by filing all of them, uh, they were able to, to, to cover it and they had kind of the common thread uh, throughout. Um, so that kind of is a way to use kind of the claimed lines um, in various embodiments that are, you know, obviously different from each other to, to make a cohesive, broader claim than any one embodiment in and of itself. Uh, the application over on the right, um, if you look at figures one and two, those, those show kind of the, the claim design, which is this uh, wavy pattern, um, which was on the article here was a, a heat reflective material. And the various embodiments in the application, um, if you'll notice what differs among them is kind of the unclaimed portion. And so what they're using the various embodiments here is to get a, a broader scope on the article that the uh, design is applied to and what is protected by the design patent, right? Here, so we have, it looks like a sleeping bag, a sock, a boot, pants, gloves, you know, so whereas if only one of those articles was shown, um, the patent office might uh, ask you to further restrict your language on what was being claimed, or you'd leave yourself open to an argument that the only article you show showed in your application or your design was, you know, a boot, and so you're limited to boot coverage. Uh, by showing all these different articles, they were, they're you know, en enhancing and broadening their coverage. You know, so this is, there is definitely good use to multiple embodiments in design patents. It just takes a, a good consideration of what it is that you want to protect, what you think your de the actual design and uh, inventive nature of it is, uh, and then how to best apply that to, to the system that we have. Uh, moving on to the litigation end of things, we had mentioned earlier the ordinary observer test. And the ordinary observer test is how you determine infringement of a design patent. And what you do is you're comparing the uh, design to the alleged infringing product. This was originally established in Gorham v. White back in 1871. And I'm not, I won't read you guys the test, but if you read there, read through it, um, it sounds very similar to the consumer confusion test. And that, that what's, what matters is, is what the, the observer thinks um, as far as, you know, is this article the same as the other one? Um, many years later, uh, in the mid 80s, a, a case came down Littleton Systems and that added a separate requirement um, where when doing your comparison, you need to look to specific novelty uh, in the design and the alleged infringing design needed to include kind of that novel element. Uh, this, this made kind of a good clean test. Um, however, it, it was difficult to apply uh, in various situations um, because in some cases you might have more than one piece of prior art. So, you know, your claim novelty might not be clear cut and when you're looking at an overall design as a whole. Um, so about 15 years later, um, an Egyptian goddess, uh, the Littleton point of novelty test was eliminated um, and the original ordinary observer test was modified and, and it was clarified that the ordinary observer test is the one and the one and only test to use. Um, however, when using the ordinary observer test, it should not be isolated strictly between the 
design patent itself and the alleged infringing product itself, but there also needs to be taken into consideration the closest prior art. Um, so in this case, um, the images on the right are from the uh, Egyptian goddess. And so instead of just carrying, comparing kind of the, the alleged infringing buffer to the design patent, uh, they also compared it to prior art uh, that had kind of some of the, the features and designs as well, right? So the prior art showed kind of the hollow tube. It, it showed the four-sided block that had buffers on each side. Um, and so the, kind of those things really shouldn't be taken into a huge consideration um, because they were in the prior art. Um, surprisingly, even though Egyptian goddess was not as clear cut of a test as, as what was previously uh, being used under Littleton, um, the amount of cases that were disposed on summary judgment, um, including those, those uh, pending infringement, I believe, uh, actually went up. Um, so in this case, it's, it's kind of the opposite of what you would, what I at least I would originally expect where we're taking kind of a more of a bright line test and moving it to more of a subjective test. You'd think that, you know, summary judgment would decrease and we'd send more things to the ultimate fact finder, uh, but that was not the case, surprisingly. Um, you'll recognize these images over here on the right. We, we, these were, with, were from the, the previous example in multiple embodiments. Um, this case recently came down in 2009, so we're, we're getting into the kind of a, the really more recent cases here. Um, and in this case, uh, the alleged infringer had a heat reflective material on their gloves uh, that's shown down on the right um, that incorporated a logo. The lower court said that kind of the minor differences um, and the or the, the, the differences in the wave pattern and the orientations and the logo were all minor differences. Um, part of the, the logo justification, there was an earlier case call uh, on LA Gear was one of the parties. Uh, in that case, the, the court said, you can't just slap your logo on a, on a thing to distinguish it as, as a design. Um, so that's part of the thing that the lower court relied upon here. Um, however, the appeals court reversed and it didn't necessarily uh, say that there was infringement or there, there was no infringement. Again, they were pushing back on the lower court's test and the, and the logic and process that they followed um, and basically telling the lower court, you gotta slow down. You have to look at everything as a whole. You need to consider the effect of the logo um, and kind of taking this piecemeal approach to kind of checking off the boxes of, okay, logo, we don't have to think about that. you know minor differences, they're just minor, um, really should have been considered as a whole. Um, so it'll be interesting to see that kind of after, after Columbia here, whether or not the trend in, uh, in the rate of disposal of cases at, at, at summary judgment will uh, maintain or whether or not we'll see, see cases kind of making it farther along the, the litigation process uh, now that the courts have been instructed to, to really look at things from a more fact specific view and a, and a broad view. Um, wrapping up, we're going to go outside of the United States and, and kind of think about, look at some things to consider when doing foreign filings. Um, foreign filings on design patents, just like, uh, you know, local national filings uh, in, here in the United States uh, can provide a great way to get coverage at a much smaller cost than utility patents. Um, you know, you, you typically, you know, your translation fees are, aren't going to be there. You know, a lot of your prosecution in, isn't going to be there, uh, that kind of thing. Um, when it comes to foreign filing, um, similar to the PCT, uh, there is the Hague Agreement in place, which permits a, a kind of a, a one application filing through the WIPO. Two key differences between WIPO filings and PCT filings is one, when you are filing your design patent through WIPO, you need to identify the countries that you're going to pursue protection in 
at the time and pay fees at the time of filing. So you can't just kind of file it like with the PCT where you can file your PCT and kind of push those decisions down the line. That's not the, not the case with WIPO. Um, also, it's, you know, that there's not an, a complete overlap between PCT countries and uh, countries that participate in the, in the Hague Agreement. Uh, specifically, for example, uh, Australia and China are not part of uh, the Hague Agreement. Um, another thing to note um, is that some countries and, and or regions don't require substantive examination and their, their systems are more of a registration system. So here in the, in the states and in some other jurisdictions, we file our, our design application. It's examined for novelty, non-obviousness, and, and the other criteria. And if we can check all the boxes and meet all the bars, then we get our design patent. Uh, in a registration basin system, you file your application, they put it on file, they say, thank you, here's your registration number. Uh, and it's not really examined until it, it goes into to force. Um, one thing uh, to note about this is that um, here in the, in the States, when you file an application, there's not a, an immediate disclosure. So you won't see kind of that design and, until it actually issues as a patent um, versus when you're doing in the registration, it can publish quite quickly. Um, so you can kind of create bars uh, for yourself in that way. Um, another distinguishment, um, two more actually. Um, one is the uh, amendment situ uh, not the amendment, the embodiments um, are not as limited for a WIPO filing. You can file as many embodiments to as many different designs as you like in a WIPO application or a, and that uh, the only restriction is that they need to be in the same Lorano class, which is, which is kind of the, the category um, that they can fit into. Um, and then also uh, amending can be a little bit more difficult to, in, in the European system and that it's not so easy in, in, to switch from claim to unclaimed lines to kind of change the scope. Um, so kind of looking at that when, when kind of filing either from abroad to here or from here to there, you want to look at kind of um, what's the best thing to, to file to get good coverage. So you want to look at kind of how the claims can be construed in different jurisdictions. Um, for example, in the EU, claim scope is um, determined simply by the drawings and kind of your disclaimers and your titles are not considered um, whereas in the UK, uh, the disclaimer would have you legal effect. And there's also kind of various registrations uh, in, or requirements in different regions. Uh, for example, uh, shading that would be encouraged here to show contours is simply not permitted in a applica design application in China. So if you're taking your US application and filing it in China, you know, you really gotta make sure that you're amending it appropriately before you file it there. Which takes us down to the very final bullet point, which is the most important bullet point on foreign filing considerations is to utilize foreign associates. They know the foreign law way better than we will um, and can kind of advise us and work with us to get the best coverage uh, and to best advise our clients uh, to kind of advance their, their needs, uh, both locally and globally. I think that wraps it up, yep. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'll check the thing. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and put them in. Chat. Looks like there's three of them in here. No. All right. Those are just a little challenge. All right. And we're not seeing any, any questions in the chat. Um, if you have any, please put them in. Again, thank you guys very much for attending. Uh, we like putting these on and hopefully you enjoy listening to them as well. Uh, if you have any questions after the fact or would like a copy of the slides, um, please go ahead and, and send us a note. Um, and that wraps this up. Thank you for joining us for today's B2IP webinar. Beach and Beaneman is a boutique intellectual property law firm based out of Southeast Michigan. Today's webinar recording will be posted to our YouTube channel, our website, and across all of our social media. Once again, thank you for joining us.